okay so uh, today we'll discuss bee trees which is the last topic of our course and the uh, bee trees uh, they're actually the the essence of a bee tree is that uh, you should note that it's not an alternate to an avl or a binary search tree the applications of a bee tree are very different and in fact uh, very practical to the uh, domain of data science uh, you can say that it, they're very important in the uh, when we actually make some databases so um, another point uh, that you should take uh, is that b trees uh, they are actually the basis of creating databases so a prereq of databases course in your uh, next or uh, the coming semesters so let's start discussing this b trees um, in general, what we need to do is, as we talked in our first lecture of this course, that um, we would need to handle very large uh, data sets. Remember, that's the one uh, important uh, aspect of data structures that uh, we need efficiency when we have more data. If we have very small amount of data, we can use arrays and they can solve um, all the purpose. But when we have um, uh, data that is uh, more than the um, th than a smaller size of data set that is a huge data set then we would need to come up with a strategy uh, to store and then to retrieve the data efficiently so uh, this lecture is specifically for the large data set so uh, let's see what are the what, what are the issues then when we have a large data set so um, the first issue is that so far we assume that uh, when we create a data structure uh, for a data set, uh, the entire data structure is in the main memory, in the RAM. And we are searching from the from the RAM. In fact, uh, when we have large data sets, uh, we, uh, we do not guarantee that our data set resides in the RAM. Some part or maybe the, the most uh, parts of the data structures would be on the hard disk. Okay, so what are the issues of having the data structure on the hard disk is that all the analysis that we have discussed so far, the, the time complexity, it actually fails. It simply fails. Why? Because we have so far assumed that every operation on the data structure would be in the RAM and would take the equal amount of time. Wherever, when, whenever, when we have some parts of the data structure in the hard disk and the other parts in the RAM, this uh, uh, equal uh, or the same uh, access time uh, guarantee is not there. Okay, so we would need to access hard disk and we need to incorporate the time involved to access the hard disk in our complexity analysis. So far, we have not done, uh, done that in our analysis. So uh, the, the analysis that we have discussed so far, it simply fails. How it fails, let's, uh, let's see that. Uh, uh, in this lecture, we'll discuss that uh, how, how a hard disk works, how is it slow, then uh, how can we actually uh, use a hard disk and still get the better efficiency. And then in the later uh, slides, we'll discuss the uh, B3, that is the solution uh, to use the hard disk for the large data sets. And we'll discuss the hard disk from the description and then we'll see different operations on the B3. So let's start with the motivation and see how hard disk is slower and how this affects the uh, overall performance of a data set. So uh, in the memory, the um, when we discuss the memory available in the system, in the computer system, uh, there are different criteria uh, to defend, uh, to actually design a memory um, structure. Um, by memory structure, what I mean is that we have, for example, registers in a computer, then we have cache, main memory, that is RAM. Then we have different type of uh, out of board storage. Uh, the, that is the CD-ROM magnetic disk, that is hard disk, then CD uh, readable, writable, so so on. And then we have some offline storage as well. I will not go in the details of this offline storage. We'll just uh, see this pyramid up till this out of board storage. So we have some memory components that are available 
own board that are on the, our motherboard of the system. Okay, so registers are directly in the CPU. So they are the fastest memory. So you see this pyramid, this tip of the pyramid means that the access time is the lowest. And this bottom of the pyramid means that the access time is bigger. So this, uh, this width of the pyramid, it shows the access time. So it is higher or bigger when we go down this pyramid and when we go up the pyramid, the access time is the fastest, is the, is the uh, smallest. So CP, uh, the registers being on the CPU on board, um, are the fastest memory access, uh, are the fastest memory. Then we have cache. This cache memory is the memory that is uh, not in the CPU, but they are on board and closest to CPU. So uh, they are very fast, very fast. Uh, you can say around 10 nanoseconds to access a cache. Uh, then we have this RAM that is still on board. Uh, on our motherboard, but uh, it's slower than the cache memory. Uh, and another aspect in this pyramid is that uh, this the tip of the pyramid, it, it shows the uh, speed of the memory component as well as the size of the memory component. So uh, the registers are the smallest in size. Then the cache is uh, bigger than registers, but still, the biggest cache may be of 128 MB. Uh, these, are, these are the maximum size of caches uh, nowadays. Uh, but usually uh, you have different levels of cache as well. So this 128 uh, MB uh, cache is actually the level 4 or L4 cache. For L1 cache, maybe a few MBs, maybe 4 or 8 MBs are, are there uh, to be used. Then for main memory, uh, for RAMs, uh, we have maybe nowadays uh, in um, some uh, good computer systems, uh, we might have some GBs of RAM. So uh, typically on laptop systems, maybe we have 8 GB or 16 GBs of RAM in good systems, but uh, these are, um, uh, they can be uh, more than this in the server systems. Then uh, these memory components that are out of the board, that are not on the motherboard of the system, that is the separate components that we attach to the motherboard via some sockets, are the, uh, the one that we are interested in is the magnetic disk. Okay, so magnetic disk is the hard disk. And you know, uh, we know that the size of a hard disk is usually measured in terabytes nowadays. So we have a hard disk that is the highest uh, or the biggest in size, but the disk access time is more than the RAM. Okay, and when we go down this pyramid, uh, we should know that the access time or the speed of the memory component, it actually decreases exponentially. And now we'll see in some coming slides that uh, what's the difference between the access time. So let's see. Um, remember that the memory is uh, actually, uh, when we discuss the size of the memory, it is in the uh, KIBs. Uh, this is one notation. That means that we are, we we actually represent the memory in term in the power of twos because the memory is actually a digital uh, uh, memory uh, or a digital data is in the form of binaries. So we can we can only uh, uh, measure the size of the memory in the powers of two. So two raised power ten is not one thousand to be exact. Okay, uh, usually usually. On the Mac systems, um, they, when when you, when you check the memory, it, it would get, give you the value 1000 uh, for 1 KB, but actually it is not 1000 bytes exactly. It's nearly 1000 bytes, but it, in, in fact, it's 1024 bytes. That is equal to 2 to the power 10. And then for megabytes is 2 to the power 20, which is not 1 million. It's 1,048,576 bytes. Similarly, for gigabytes and terabytes, we, uh, we actually measure them in the powers of 2. So 2 is about 40 is 1 terabyte, 2 is about 30 is 1 gigabyte. So uh, now we'll talk about uh, the memory, um, uh, size of the memories in terms of these KIBs, MIBs, GIBs, and TIBs. So uh, that was one clarification that I wanted you to uh, actually uh, uh, understand before uh, going into the details of the size and access time of the memory. So uh, the access time of the memory, usually a cache is around one gigahertz uh, to, it takes one gigahertz uh, 
uh, the, the, the clock cycle, the clock time of the cache is around one gigahertz. For the main memory, it's 100 megahertz, and for the hard disk, it's only 100 hertz. So you see, uh, this decrease in the uh, in in the speed of the memory. That's two. Uh, that's the exponential decrease. Uh, for one gigahertz, what you can say is that it takes one nan 10 nanoseconds to read a data item. Uh, for 100 megahertz, you can say that it takes around uh, 100 uh, nanoseconds to read a data element. For 100 hertz in a hard disk, it's like uh, around um, maybe 100 or maybe 1000 milliseconds. So there is a huge difference here uh, in the uh, access time of a hard disk. So now we are talking about a hard disk that is so slower but still we we are actually um, uh, we are restricted to store our data on the hard disk and still we want to access the data uh, in a way that we uh, we can actually come up with an efficient data structure so that's the problem that we are going to solve in this lecture using a bt so uh, let's talk about the, the hard disk in a more in some more details because there is another aspect uh, where we see that BTs are important and they are not just the alternate to an AVLT, actually they are required when we have uh, larger data sets. In fact, uh, when we are studying data structures, we are talking about the data sets that are enormous in size. Okay, so it's important to see the data structures that can uh, handle uh, such uh, data sets. So uh, for a hard disk, what we actually um, what we actually need to know here is that uh, this circular part, this is actually this this entire circle. This would be one track or one ring. Okay, so one ring of this. If we if we see this, this is the surface of a hard disk plate, metal metallic plate. Or if you see it in this way, that this is one plate, that is, this is one metallic plate in the hard disk on which the data is stored in the form of the electric impulses. And then if we just divide this plate and we see it from the top, uh, we see that it has different rings. So the outer ring is a, a ring is of the of a bigger size. The inner ring, the ring this second one, is of a smaller, uh, maybe uh, radius than this. Uh, circumference then this third one is further smaller this fourth one fifth one so uh, we have in this picture we have five five rings or five tracks okay uh let me write this five over here and remove it from here okay so uh, we have five uh, different tracks then for a sector a sector is a pie shaped piece so you see this portion this one roughly my drawing shows this pie shape portion this is one sector okay so let me just uh let me just remove this line from here and write it here that we have one two three four five six seven eight so we have eight different sectors in this uh, layout then uh, the intersection of these two, this track and a sector is, for example, for the outermost part, this shaded area is actually the intersection of a pie, of a sector and a track. So this red shaded area is actually one block, this, this area. Okay, so there are plenty of blocks on this specific structure. Okay, now this block, this term, this block term is important to remember here when we discuss uh, hard disk storage because the unit of data reading from a hard disk is actually one block. So let's see this in more details uh, because uh, at the moment we are discussing the speed of a hard disk. Later we'll discuss the, uh, the, the data read uh, operation in detail for a hard disk, but uh, at the moment we are discussing the speed. So uh, the, the the plate that I, I just sh uh, shown you in the previous slide is the is this one okay this this surface on top and you can see that the, we have multiple plates here so on this side we can see that we have around three plates right this is first plate this one is second plate and then this 
bottom one is the third player. player. So we have three players on this hard, hard disk. Usually we have more than that, uh, more than three. But in this specific scenario, we have three players here in this picture. Okay, so these players or platters are here. Okay, then we have this 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 metallic component, this component here. This is actually the uh, this is actually the part that actually moves on this plate, and then it has this um, this actually a reading area uh, that actually reads the data from this plate. Okay, th th this is the part that actually detects the um, or you can see, uh, this this actually detects the um, the the uh, impulse electric impulse or the current available on this metallic plate. Okay, and this area when it needs to read this hard disk what it needs to do is that it needs to move uh, from this po portion this is the innermost ring to this outermost ring in order to ident in, in order to address a specific portion of the hard disk so this is the this is the movement uh, or if i just write here this is the movement this is in the both both in that direction this is one uh, mechanical movement of this this head of the or uh, you can say read head of the hard disk okay so this is one movement that that we require when we address a, a block in the memory then the second thing is that for example let me just remove this part now we'll discuss another important uh, part here uh, on this plate the first movement is that we need to move from one a sector to another sector that is the ring okay then another movement here is that we for example if i want to read this specific block of this uh, metallic plate what i would need to do is that i would need to rotate this plate and and take this part uh, under this head of the hard disk Okay, and then I would need to move the head from this position if it is it's in this position at this position. I would need to move it in this uh, at this specific uh, location. So this one rotation, I call it a rotation. This is one movement of the hard disk, and then this specific uh, movement of the head is the second rotation. That's or you can say movement of the head. So we have two mechanical adjustments uh, before we can uh, read a data element okay so we would we need to rotate the platter and we need to move the head to that specific um, sector to read a given block okay and in order to increase the uh, the speed or increase or increase the size of the data read what we can do is that we can write the data on the front part of this platter then we can write the data on the on the lower part of this platter then we can similarly uh, if this head and the rotation is actually done we can read the data from all these three platters simultaneously and from both the upper and the lower side of the platter so we have actually for these three platters we have six sides on which data can be written and read from and with one rotation and the movement of the head we can read data simultaneously from all these six portions of the hard disk of these platters so combining all those six different uh um, the data from all these six different portion makes one block of the data okay so i hope this uh, entire mechanism of a hard disk data read and write operation is clear now that we can read uh, we can divide a block onto multiple platters because all these platters move in unison unison and when we read uh, when we actually adjust one platter actually we have already adjusted the uh, other platters as well and as this is a metallic plate we can store data on both sides of this plate so we have for three platters we have actually six different sides from where we can read the data uh, in one go or uh, in uh, after one rotation and movement so we call that entire data as one block okay so this is how uh, we can actually we actually increase the or we actually determine the um the uh, the time or the cost of the data read 
and then we can also decide the size of the data that that we can read from one um, one movement of the different parts of the hard disk okay so this is um, uh, this is the discussion about the structure and the mechanical uh, parts of the hard disk uh, let's just uh, see them in some numbers so uh, uh, we actually need to spin the disk and move the head these are the two movement these are these are the two movements that i discussed uh, in the previous on the previous slide then uh, now let's put them in numbers so spinning the disk is around 7200 rpms or revolutions per minute for a hard disk for a, for a good hard disk nowadays and uh, there are hard disks that are actually uh, better uh, in revolutions per minute than this 7200 but then there is another insight here we would ignore simply ignore the costly hard disks here and the reason behind this uh, behind the ignore ignorance of those uh, high end hard disks or what uh, there is always a comment of using ssds we are not using ssds here okay we just ignore that we we can use ssds the reason behind this is that um, the the reason is more of a financial or economical uh, than of the speed uh, instead of using a very uh, high end hard disk or an ssd we use uh, very normal uh, low cost hard disks that are mechanical in nature and we allow them them to fail ssds uh, are actually less prone to failure uh, whereas the mechanical devices they they are very prone to failure as well so why do we still um, insist on using the low end hard disk is that um, if i just talk about google what google does is that they just let the hard disks to fail and they actually use the low end hard disk in their data servers and the reason behind that is that they use them simultaneously so they do not have only one hard disk that is working they have multiple systems they uh, they work in um, unison or you can say that is the they are the they use the distributed systems so they have multiple hard disks in fact thousands of hard disks on thousands of systems and what they do is that uh, this they distribute the data on all of them and they create multiple copies of data on them so if one uh, hard disk fails they still have uh, other copies available for that data right and these failure rates are uh, very common but uh, uh, this is the adjustment that uh, google does and they have actually uh, formulated a mathematical model that in order to ensure the availability of their system uh, they need to have maybe n number of hard disks and m number of copies so uh, having those m number of uh, copies and n number of hard disks they ensure the availability of the data and they ensure that that that, that, that they won't lose any important information okay so in that scenario uh, they use um, when they allow the hard disk to fail they actually want them to be very cheap they they use cheap hard disk hard disks instead of having uh, costly hard disk uh, in on the servers so a cheap hard disk if, even if it fails they have backups and they can replace the uh, failed hard disk in a very less uh, uh, financial cost and this model actually works better than having uh, some high end hard disks okay so that is why we are only uh, discussing the mechanical hard disk of maybe 7200 rpms here okay so i hope i have i've actually uh, cleared the uh, briefly discussed the idea that having uh, that that we can have uh, low and cheap hard disks uh, with um, that we can replace but we can have multiple copies of those and we can replace them in a uh, very low cost so having uh, uh, those devices in a system are better than having high end devices uh, to improve the performance okay so for this 7200 rpm hard disk we, we can have 120 disk accesses per second you can just uh, find that after some mathematical operations and on average um, if we talk about many uh, disk operations uh, we can say that uh, uh, on average a disk need to uh, needs to move halfway to find that required data maybe one um, 
for one axis it moved it took almost the complete circle but for the uh, for another read it took only maybe a, a small portion of the disc uh, rotation maybe another operation actually luckily it was exactly on the place where the rotation had had is already uh, positions positioned so it 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 didn't need any movement this operation needed some movement but this uh, th the first operation needed a lot of movements there so if we average all of these operations we can say that we on the average we need to move halfway for every operation and if this is the time to for the rotation then we need to move the disk head as well to move it to the specific uh, sector of the hard disk so a uh, ring of the hard disk so these are the two movements and we have taken the average then um, if you assume that one cpu can take 500 million instructions per second that's that's an average cpu not a very high end cpu but if a cpu can take 500 million instructions per second um, this in these numbers uh, 120 disk accesses per second these numbers translate into on into the um, disk access time to be around equal to 4 million instructions executed on the CPU of 500 million instructions per second. So that's a big setback. Uh, one disk access is worth 4 million instructions. So remember when we were talking about the RAM or the classical data structures, we discussed that everything is in RAM and the uh, access time from a RAM is very similar or maybe a few uh, instructions on a CPU. So we can just uh, accept that cost. But for a hard disk, this cost is too much. We cannot simply say that having a CPU that can take so many, that, that, that can execute so many instructions, we, if we just um, uh, do one hard disk access, uh, our entire system collapses. So that is the reason that we need to uh, use a data structure that data structure that is built upon the idea of accessing the hard disk for a data read. Okay, uh, all other data structures, trees, maybe uh, they are not actually designed to read data from a hard disk. We'll see this analysis in a few slides. So let's discuss that um, now. Uh, the other aspect, this was the first aspe aspect of the uh, reading data from the hard disk, is that the uh, hard disk access is very slow. Now, moving on to the second aspect, is that when we address the memory on a hard disk, the, uh, the addressing is very different than the addressing in RAM. In RAM, what we have is that we have the byte addressable um, RAM. Uh, if you want to read one byte from the RAM, we just address, give the address of that byte and read the data from there. Whereas um, in, a, in, in a hard disk, the idea is very different. When we access a hard disk, we need, we need so many mechanical movements and we just don't read one byte from uh, after doing all those complicated uh, movements and time taking movements. We read uh, an entire block that is usually maybe 512, or maybe usually we have this 4K byte, uh, 4K block size. You can have 8K block size as well. This is what you specify when you format your hard disk or uh, the, the simple operation when you when you actually format your um, maybe just one partition, you can simply see that you also mentioned the size of a block. Okay, so uh, the size of a block it means that you need you read so many bytes in just one read of a hard disk. So this is where we actually overcome the cost of the uh, the, the time cost of the hard disk. We can read many bytes in one uh, operation. So if even if it takes uh, around a few milliseconds to read a hard disk, we can read so many bytes in one access. So we'll we'll like to use this uh, aspect of the hard disk. Okay, so we would we would like to use this uh, uh, this this uh, actually uh, angle that we can read so much data. So, so uh, why not read the relevant data all at, at in one hard disk access? 
okay so that's the second concept that we that we would like to go uh, towards so uh, in, in in general uh, in a ram what we have is in in a ram when we address one byte we read if we address this is the address if we address one byte we read the data in that byte or we can write something onto that byte so this is the address of one byte whereas in the hard disk when we address something the address is of an entire block so this in fact not this one uh, this red portion is actually here uh, this red portion is actually one block that, that contains so many bytes and from all these bytes we then we take all these bytes into the ram and then from the ram we ex address this one byte that that gives us the data from the hard disk okay so that's that's the concept that we we have so many bytes there why not use these bytes um, and create a data structure that uh, give us that, that actually tries to give us the relevant data uh, uh, in one block instead of having randomly as uh, allocated data and then reading one relevant byte we would like to have all these data set to uh, all these data elements to be very relevant uh, and we read them one in in one hard disk access and use them for many later accesses from the ram okay so in general uh, in the, uh, the summary is that the hard disk are, hard disks are very slow but they are divided into blocks so we can read a, a huge amount of data in one read, read. okay so uh, uh, we would like uh, we would uh, try to overcome this speed with this uh, size of the data rate. okay so that's the summary that uh, now we want to devise a data structure that can take care of these two properties of a hard disk and help us store the larger um, data sets uh, and process them efficiently so let's put this all this discussion in perspective uh, we studied avl tree so that was the balanced uh, tree and it was a search tree as well so it was the most efficient data structure that we have discussed so far so let's just compare this uh, with the current scenario so if we have 2 raised power 30 data elements we need at least 30 levels uh, for an avl tree of uh, that is 100% balanced or a completely balanced but if that is not completely balanced some branches are long, uh, longer than the others then uh, roughly we we need to have 43 levels and on each level what we have is for example this is an avl tree it's a binary tree so uh, when we read this data element for example the root is in the ram uh, we are not guaranteed that the left or the right child is also in the ram if the data set is this data set is actually very big okay it's so big that uh, the having these two pointers for every node makes it the size of only pointers to be 8 gb so 8 gb is only the size of the pointers not we are not including the size of the data data here so uh, this is obviously bigger than the size of the ram which means that the some portions of this avl tree are on the ram and some are on the hard disk so assuming that the root is in the hard disk uh, is in the ram we access this root and if we want to find a data element and uh, which is on the on the lower levels maybe on the leaf level this is the 43rd maybe this is the 43rd level so we want to reach this 43rd level uh, root is in the ram we accessed it we saw that the value is in the left sub we we tried to access this value but this was in the now this maybe this value is in the hard disk so we had one hard disk input output io operation we we read this uh, child then we found that the value is towards further left and unfortunately this left child is also not in the ram it's in the hard disk because when we access this element we had to actually move some parts some data from the ram to the hard disk and load this node in the ram so maybe there was a scenario that the the relevant portions of the tree they were previously in the in the ram but bef, uh, but for reading this new node from the hard disk into the ram we moved the available data from ram to the hard disk so 
possibly this uh, this uh, node also needs an IO operation. Similarly, if we need to do an IO operation for all the nodes in the path, we need to do or uh, at the at the worst case forty three hard disk operations. And we we saw that one hard disk read operation was very costly. And we we are not guaranteed that all these nodes are uh, stored on the hard disk on the uh, same address or the closer addresses. So maybe uh, they are randomly placed on the hard disk and um, every operation it actually required the hard disk to rotate to the maximum and then uh, move the head to the maximum as well. So the worst case scenario makes it a very costly op operation and the cost is actually around point for the for these numbers it is for, for these number and the numbers on the previous slides uh, the same numbers we are using here is around 0.43 seconds to read just one value and remember in order to do bigger operations we this uh, one read operation is very simple operation maybe if you just want to display uh, the entire tree one read operation if it takes 0.43 seconds and we need to do 2 raised to power 30 read operations. So see, only displaying of the entire data set, it would take 0.43 seconds into 2 raised to power 30. This is the time that only one in-order traversal or any traversal would take. So this is, this is definitely unacceptable here when we are actually talking about the uh, about a uh, about the efficiency of our data structure. So uh, I think uh, I hope that now we are actually getting the point that having a, 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 a the most efficient data structure in this scenario still is not acceptable. So we need something different. Okay. So uh, what we would do here is that we would actually take all the knowledge that we have so far and try to come up with an with an another efficient approach so the approach is that uh, the, the only issue was that we had 43 levels of the tree so we need to decrease those levels or the height of the tree and what we can do to decrease the height of the tree is that we can use more branches what we can have is that instead of having uh, two children of this root node we can have many children we can have maybe m children we can have m array or m v tree in that way uh, in fact we'll discuss this m v tree in details in the next next uh, um, slide but you see having m v uh, uh, tree what we would have is that we would actually uh, adjust so many values on this level one then if we again have five or six children of each children of each node then we would have exponentially more number of children on the on the second level and we can adjust the same number of values in a very few levels okay so that the, the the height or the depth of the tree would decrease if we just increase the width of each level so this is an mv tree and remember this should be a search tree because we do not want to lose the efficiency of the search operation okay so this is a search tree which means that uh, if this node it has four children it should have at least three values in it so if we have three values here uh, for each value there is one left pointer and one right pointer okay so if we just look at this thing uh, for this first value this maybe i can call it a second is b and then third is c for a we should have a pointer that points to a node that has smaller values than a then we should have a pointer that has actually if it's between a and b which means it has the values it, it points to a node that has the values which are bigger than a and smaller than b then for this third pointer which is between b and c uh, the values on this node should be bigger than B but smaller than C. And for the last pointer, the value should be greater than C. So for three values, we have four pointers. And for each pointer, we have a node that has the values that correspond to the, to the corresponding value in the 
parent. So for this specific uh, node that is drawn here, let me just uh, use the picture. So what we, what we would have is that these values are the, uh, the values in this subtree are the smaller values and this is the smallest value of the tree. And this one is the biggest value of the tree. And um, what you can say is that this branch of the tree has smaller values than this branch of the tree. And this, the value on the root node between these two pointers is the value that comes between these, these uh, the, between the values of this largest value and this smallest value. Okay, and we grow the tree similarly uh, to the next levels as well. So this is an m way search tree. Now we know if we want to find the value that is smaller, we would go to this branch. If we want to find a value that is between the first and second value of the root, then we would go to this second branch. And then similarly to the third and fourth branch for the uh, bigger values. Okay, so that is an m way search tree. So uh, as an, an example tree is that, uh, on the root node, we have value 10, 30, and 35, and uh, the values smaller than 10 are in this sub branch, and the values between 10 and 30 should be on the second branch, values between 30 and 35 should be on the third branch, and values bigger than 35 should be in the fourth branch. So this, this is a four-way tree. And you can see for a four-way tree, we should have three values or three keys in the parent. So these are also the data items or the keys of the data items. Uh, but now we have a relationship. If we have an M way tree, we should have M minus one values in the parent. Okay, so that's the idea of an M way tree. So what it would do is that it would, uh, when we have more values, this these M minus one values in the in a node, what we would have is that we would actually have more data in one node. And all these data items, they are actually uh, related to each other. They are in the sequence. So when these values are in the sequence, it means that uh, when we read them, we can read as much related items uh, as, uh, as our one block of hard disk allows us. So if one block of hard disk is of 4 KB, what we can do is that we can increase the size of one node to be equal to around 4 KB including the point the size of the pointers so the size the, the size of the of one node should be around 4 kb so when we read 4 kbs from the hard disk in one operation we read all the relevant data and this would actually give us um, uh, in the first place it would uh, um, if we have more rela relevant data in the in the ram when we read uh, when we perform one read operation from the hard disk then essentially uh, we might not need another disk access. But still, if we need a disk access, we have, we, we actually, uh, because we have so many keys in one node, uh, it means that the tree is wi wider than, than being deeper. Uh, so it means that uh, we have less levels in the tree. So even if we move from the root level to the leaf level, we still uh, need very few disk operations because there are only maybe three or four levels in the tree. So we'll see in the later slides that a B tree is is useful when it it's it's uh, it's actually uh, created in a way that it it's not more than four or three. In fact, three or four. Uh, levels deep. Okay, so when we we would discuss about the final structure that is the B tree, we would decide the size of one node on the basis of the data, and on the basis of the block size that uh, we do not need to uh, have more than three or four levels in the tree. That is three to four read accesses are the maximum accesses for each operation. Okay, so uh, this MV tree helps in that. Then it's a search tree. Uh, so uh, it takes all the properties of a binary search tree. That is, we move on along the exactly the same branch that we need uh, to, to, to go to, to read a value. Okay, so if a binary tree is of log 2 of n, then uh, an MV tree is log m of n. Remember, this branching factor is actually the base of the log. Uh, 
So M V three is actually uh, of lesser height, and le uh, consequently, it would it would have less number of hard disk accesses. So uh, in in this in this picture, we can see a three way tree. A three way tree on the root it has two values. Then if we just uh, increase an, another level, what we would have is that we can have in two levels we can have eight values. Then if we increase another level, we can we can accommodate twenty six values in just three levels of a of an M V tree. And for th for these uh, this third level, if we add another level, remember now each node has two values, so we can accommodate around eighty values in just three levels. Whereas we we saw in the binary tree that it would be two raised to the power something. So for three levels, it would, it would be two raised to the power three. That is around eight values. So th this is a there is a uh, there is a very very pleasant increase in the uh, values that we can accommodate uh, when we have an MV tree. So um, uh, we'll discuss the uh, B tree in the next video. So I hope the idea is clear that a B tree uh, that is an MV tree. Uh, if if we just start from an MV tree, we can we can actually accommodate so many concerns that we had for all the other data structures. So uh, just create a, a a B tree as an MV tree. So what it has is that uh, every node should have m minus one keys if it's an MV tree. Okay, so MV tree has m children and and m minus one key, and uh, the keys are partitioned among children that they are in the form of a search tree which means that the the the, the parent if it it has values uh, that i just told you that if it if it values uh, abc then the smaller values would be uh, smaller values than a would be in the first child then values between a and b would be in the second child and so on so there's a search tree and the, this root node in a b tree for an mv tree is a special node and it can have uh, two or it, it, it can have children uh, between two and m. So even if the tree is maybe five ways, uh, where we we can we 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 see that if it's a five way tree, each node should have at least four values. But the root node can have two values. We'll see that uh, why we need these two values. Uh, we need to relax this condition for the root node specifically. And uh, all non-leaf nodes except the root node, um, that is, uh, all the internal nodes of the tree, they should have between m by two and m children. So the minimum number of childrens that children that a node can have is m by two. Okay, and then the last condition is that all the leaves are on the same level. So uh, uh, we'll uh, we'll stop here for this uh, video. In the next video, we'll discuss the uh, B tree in details, but we have just uh, put the perspective of hard disk into the M V tree, and we have uh, linked that M V tree to a B tree. So, um, in the next video, we'll discuss the um, some further details of the B tree.